Well, good morning and uh, a very warm welcome. Uh, it's great to see so many people at this session. Um, and I'm going to start by telling you uh, a little bit about how we're going to run it. I'm David Rossington. Uh, I'm the senior responsible owner, in the jargon, uh, for the cross-government work on communities. And I work in communities and local government. Uh, and with me, I've got Campbell Robb, uh, who heads up the Office of the Third Sector, uh, and uh, Steve Weiler from the Development Trust Association. And uh, we're each going to speak for about sort of 10, 15 minutes, uh, and then we can have a, a, a question and uh, answer and sort of general debate and comment session. Uh, and we'll try and leave as much time as possible for that, because communities is a subject that is best, that is best discussed uh, rather than lectured about. Um, we've called the session Quality Street, Unwrapping the Secrets of a Successful Community. Uh, and I'm going to start the unwrapping uh, by telling you a little bit about uh, the cross-government work on, on communities, uh, which I think is, is genuinely exciting. Um, it's something that really no individual government department can, can do on its own, uh, and it's something that uh, government can't do on its own either. It, it sort of reaches out uh, through uh, the voluntary and third sector, uh, uh, into lots of community organisations, and into many people's lives. So this is um, an exciting and challenging and, I think, quite innovative area of social policy. Uh, and when we come to the Q&A and comments, uh, if you've got um, ideas on how we could do this better, uh, then uh, we're very much in the market for that. So um, let me kick off uh, by telling you uh, a little bit about uh, the cross-government work. And I'm afraid there's going to be a bit of what you might call jargon in this. Um, but try and put that on one side, and I think the important thing to remember about this area of work is that it is about people. Uh, it's about people in groups, uh, and it's about people's perceptions and behaviour. Uh, and the jargon can sometimes mask that, um, but it is obviously an essential, uh, you know, a very people-centred piece of work. Now, um, the, the sort of formal title of this work is Public Service Agreement Number 21. So there are 30 cross-government public service agreements which were um, agreed a couple of years ago, uh, and this is number 21 of them. Uh, and it's described formally as being about building active, empowered, and cohesive communities. Now, the sort of um, things that it involves are um, helping communities to provide more input on the services they get so that they can shape those services uh, much better to people's needs. Um, it's about uh, helping communities to face the, you know, the problems of the current uh, economic downturn and, and find a way through that. And actually, whether communities are strong or not uh, matters a great deal there. Um, and it's about partnership. It's about lots of different bodies inside the public sector and outside the public sector working together. Uh, this is not a command and control world at all. Absolutely the opposite. Um, and it's all quite difficult, actually. But one of the things that is helpful uh, is that I think we've got a pretty clear way here of measuring uh, what we mean by success. Uh, and again, in the sort of formal terms, there are six individual strands to this piece of work. Four of them happen to be owned by my department, Communities and Local Government, uh, and those are to do with uh, whether different groups get on well together in communities and citizen power, empowerment. Uh, there's one strand which is uh, about the third sector uh, and its strength, uh, which is obviously led by the Office of the Third Sector within the Cabinet Office, uh, and one about um, people's participation in sport and leisure activities, which is led by the Department of Culture, Media and Sport. Um, and the good news is that we actually do have ways of measuring progress here. Um, even in the areas where we're talking about people's perceptions, which are 
particularly at the communities and local government areas, the areas to do with different groups getting on well together and um, empowerment. Uh, we, have the, we, we have a means of measuring because we carry out regular uh, and uh, big uh, statistical surveys which tell us how people's perceptions are moving. Um, and we actually, uh, somewhat to my surprise actually, uh, our measurement system was assessed by the National Audit Office, who are um, pretty stringent on these matters, and they gave us a green. Uh, and uh, uh, so that's, uh, you know, that is actually um, uh, one of the strengths of the area. I shall come along to the challenges later, and there are plenty of them. Um, I think it's worth thinking a little bit about what we mean by a community. Um, and this slide tries to bring together different aspects of that. I, I think sort of having a single dictionary definition actually is, is probably not very helpful. But the kind of things I bring out are, first of all, um, communities, I mean, we all belong to communities. Um, at the sort of very basic level, uh, some communities relate to places. So we might belong to a community in our village or um, uh, area of London or area of a big city. Um, some of them don't. So uh, we might belong to a community which is, for example, a community of women's groups or, or whatever other kind of sort of non-place-based community. Um, and I think the other important thing is that most of us don't just belong to one. Actually, because we're complicated individuals, we belong to lots of them and we do that at the same time. Um, so, you know, we might belong to um, a school community because our kids go to the local school. We might belong to um, uh, uh, a religious community because we go to the local church or mosque or whatever. Um, we might be volunteers uh, and so on and so forth. And we can be all those things at the same time. Um, so, um, I think I, 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 I just want to bring out the, you know, the, the, the complexity here. Uh, we're not talking about one thing. We're not talking about something that is fixed. Uh, again, uh, the communities that we belong to and the shape and boundaries of those communities will change quite a lot over time. Um, next thing I want to say is a little bit about how we are trying to create these active, um, empowered and cohesive communities. Um, and this is absolutely not an area where central government can say, uh, we are going to uh, you know, make sure that every community does X. I mean, that is simply not uh, a possible way forward because communities are created by people in communities. They're not created by the state. And that's, um, that's kind of uh, um, you know, a sort of basic axiom. Um, so that means per that as a result... Um, the, the way of uh, making communities stronger and better uh, is complicated and involves lots of different organisations and people. Um, so it will involve uh, in central government, not just my department, communities, uh, the Cabinet Office and DCMS. It involves a very wide range of government departments. Uh, it involves every local authority, uh, it involves um, community groups, uh, it involves uh, the police, it involves the health service, pretty much every public body uh, uh, and uh, everybody operating in the, the space of civil society has a role here. Um, and that means that in terms of what central government's role can be, um, it's, it's really, I think, about sort of two main Things. It's, it's first of all about signalling and communication um, uh, and uh, some uh, national campaigns which, which demonstrate what works and what doesn't work. Um, and it's about getting the right system in place so that all the other people who are, uh, who are uh, helping to deliver here uh, have the right incentives and frameworks within which they operate. And that's kind of um, where we are. And this is very different to some of the other public service agreements where um, there is much more of a sort of defined uh, uh, what you might call command and control structure that there really isn't here. Um, 
What achievements so far? Well, this is a sort of um, uh, list, and, and I don't want to dwell too much on it, of um, some of the things that uh, we've been doing in central government. Uh, we published a white paper about a year ago which set out uh, a sort of plan. It was called Communities in Control, and there are a whole variety of individual uh, projects and, frankly, experiments uh, under that uh, plan which are now being implemented. The one I would select, which I think is um, uh, really perhaps one of the most important, uh, is a program for uh, improving the financial vi viability of community organisations called Community Builders, which um, is a substantial fund. It's uh, £70 million, pounds, uh, and you know, at this time of uh, uh, constraints on budgets, it's actually a pretty unique opportunity to, to strengthen... Um, uh, uh, the finances and, and, and uh, thereby the achievements of community organisations. Um, other things that have happened, the, the Office of the Third Sector, as Campbell will say, have uh, launched uh, a programme to help the third sector through some of the worst effects of the current downturn. Um, and um, there's uh, uh, a, a programme of transferring assets uh, which aren't uh, used from local authorities to community organisations, which is being run by something called the Asset Transfer Unit, which uh, is part of the Development Trust Association, and I'm sure Steve will have a little bit to say about that later on. Um, so what are the challenges here? Well, I think anything which involves seeking to change perceptions, seeking to alter behaviour, is intrinsically quite difficult. And um, the difficulty is magnified because this is quite cutting-edge stuff. We cannot always be sure that the individual policies that we're following will have absolutely desired effects. I mean, we, we, you know, I, this is not uh, an evidence-free zone by any means. There's actually quite a lot of evidence on what works and what doesn't work. But it's not a totally populated picture and in some ways, um, actually, uh, the UK government is, is, is probably you know, among the um, leading governments in the world in this, in this kind of area. So uh, we are out on our own, and sometimes it's lonely, uh, and uh, we, we, we can't be absolutely sure about the cause and effect. I've mentioned the delivery chain, um, and uh, I should mention also that, obviously, you know, in a time of economic downturn, when lots of communities are facing significant stresses, uh, then you know, that in itself uh, is a major challenge for, for this area of work. Um, I want to go on to say a little bit about um, what's known in the trade as cohesion, that's different groups getting on well together, and a little bit about citizen engagement and empowerment. Um, and um, in terms of uh, cohesion... I think I'm going to go on to the map, actually, because that uh, explains the picture a little bit more clearly. Um, cohesion is one of the things that we, we do survey, and uh, a couple of weeks ago we published something called the Place Survey 2008, which is a very, very big survey. It's based on surveying 500,000 people uh, around the country. Um, uh, and the survey took place sort of about uh, six months ago, something like that. And what this shows, uh, it's the dark areas on this map where the cohesion scores, the scores for different groups getting on well together, are lower. Nationally, the picture's pretty good. Um, around sort of 75, 80% of people are, are, are saying that uh, they get on uh, well uh, or, or reasonably well uh, in terms of groups in, in their area. Um, in these dark coloured areas, though, uh, the figures are lower sort of some, in the worst cases, probably 40, 50 percent. And you can see they're sort of concentrated around um, uh, the M6, what you might call the M62 corridor, uh, the wash, where there's been very significant uh, recent levels of migration, East London, and to some extent the northeast. So this map is telling us that actually those are the areas to watch, uh, particularly uh, in terms of different groups getting on well together. Um, a couple of case studies which uh, uh, you can look at in more detail uh, it, uh, afterwards if you want. Uh, one is about um, how uh, in uh, a place called Old Ford, 
uh, involving people in the running of community centres actually made that much more effective. Um, the other one is about uh, something called the Big Lunch, which you may have heard of, uh, which uh, uh, my department happens to be sponsoring. We're not running it. It's being uh, run by um, uh, the... Uh, uh, or, or it's been launched by uh, Tim Smith, who's the chief executive of the Eden Project in Cornwall. And the idea is quite simply that on the 19th of July, um, people throughout the UK uh, get together and they have lunch on the street together and they get to know each other much more. It's a bit like a sort of um, uh, uh, meal version of comic relief, I guess. And, and over time, uh, it, uh, uh, it shows every sign of establishing itself in that way. So... Um, uh, we're very glad to be sponsoring this, uh, and we're hoping it doesn't rain too much on the 19th of July, and that lots of people go along and enjoy, um, enjoy the street parties. Um, and there is a serious point to that, actually, because um, so much of the work on cohesion is actually um, about people making contact with each other and recognising that there's more that joins them, however different they may think they are, them that keeps them apart and very simple things like sort of you know talking eating together can can make a big difference here um, moving on to engagement and empowerment um, now this is this is really about giving people more say uh, in in uh, you know the, the the things that affect their lives um, and it's interesting because uh, if you look across the political spectrum uh, you'll find that uh, all the major political parties are giving increasing prominence to this um, as something that, that really matters. Um, we survey this as well, and this is a, a map of the country which shows the score on whether people think they've got influence over decisions that are taken in their local area. And um, there, the first thing to say is that the scores are quite a lot lower uh, than they are for cohesion, so... The, the national average score from the Places Survey is a little under 30%. That means 70% of people are saying that they don't have uh, uh, the influence that they want over local decisions, which I think is quite a, you know, quite a significant and alarming figure. Um, and there you'll notice that the picture is much more evenly spread. You know, there are areas which differ from others, but uh, uh, it is much more uh, of, of a, an issue, actually, which... which uh, applies right across England. Um, and again, um, the, the sort of uh, the way forward here is, is very much about local programmes in local areas. A couple more case studies for you to look at, uh, one in Birmingham uh, and one in, in Newcastle, which is uh, actually extremely interesting. It's, it's a, a, a project which has been running for a couple of years now, and it's actually uh, giving school children some say in the way in which um, budgets which affect them are distributed and you know, helping them to learn about uh, how to participate, how to express a view, you know, how to make a difference. Um, and I just wanted to end uh, by making the point again that uh, the activity in this area is not something which is just confined to my department, um, Campbell's or DCMS. Um, if you look right across uh, the, the sort of social policies that uh, uh, the government is uh, uh, undertaking, you know, there are policies which will have an effect on how communities work, you know, whether it's from the, the borders agencies, uh, activities on migration, uh, whether it's uh, to do with... Um, uh, uh, helping migrants to this country learn English quickly and easily, whether it's to do with adult learning, whether it's to do with uh, environmental campaigns. Pretty much whatever government department you work in, um, you will have some impact uh, on, on what's going on in this, P uh, in this PSA. And at that point, after that introduction, I want to pass over to Campbell. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, welcome. My name is Campbell Robb. I'm the Director General of the Officer Sector in the Cabinet Office, the longest title in government, uh, if not necessarily the most influential. Uh, um, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm going to do a quick survey. I think we need to liven up. Uh, who put your hand up if you volunteer in the last month? One lady there, a few there, not so many. If you gave money to charity in the last month? Hey, now that's what we like to see. Uh, if you, uh, okay, that'll do for just now. I'll keep the rest of the questions for later. I'll warm you up a bit again later. Um, you are, therefore, in my opinion, already taking part in creating uh, a better community, whether that's the community which where you live or the community of interest in which you have uh, or by uh, giving money to communities across the world uh, from your donations. Uh, part of the premise of what we do in the Office of the Sector and part of the government's policy around the third sector is that it has a huge contribution, by no means the only contribution, but as a huge contribution to make to helping communities get better. Because what actually we're all interested in, and all of us as civil servants are interested in, is the same thing. It's allowing people in communities, individuals, to face up to the challenges that they face in their lives or in their communities and giving them the solutions to solve those problems for themselves. That's really what we're all in the business of doing. That's what we want to do. We want to create sustainable, cohesive, empowered communities who take on the challenges that they face and they do that themselves. I'm just going to tell a couple of stories because that's what this is about. Um, I appeared before the Public Accounts Committee recently uh, to account for how the Office of the Third Sector uh, uh, takes its money, a quite a challenging experience as a civil servant. The week before, we'd held a reception in the House of Commons for a programme we call Grassroots Grants, a fantastic programme where we've got local funders giving very small amounts of money to community organisations, as little as five or eight hundred pounds. And I was talking to a woman from a carers association up north, and she knew I was the kind of in charge of giving out the money. And this is the week before I go to the parliamentary committee. And I said, how have you spent the money that we gave you? And she said, well, we got about £800. And I said, what did you do with it? She looked a little bit sheepish. I said, no, it's OK. You can tell me. She said, well, well, essentially, we went to the pub. And I said, OK, you might want to talk me through that uh, a little bit. Well, we, we have about 15, 20 multiple carers who look after maybe five or six or seven different people in their family or that they look after. And what we used half of the money you gave us to was to get a carer for each of those people's carers. So that's another 40 carers. And then we hired a room in a pub and we hired a comedian who she said was terrible. And we took those people out for the first time in two or three years. And they sat in a pub, they had a drink and they listened to a comedian. That's £800 of government money bloody well spent, I think, in terms of creating and empowering people to feel different in their community. Those people will go back, they'll feel empowered, they'll feel different about their relationships with other people. That's what, as simple as that, that can be built in communities. It can be as complex and as difficult as the cohesion agenda we face. We're all reminded of that yesterday with the, the anniversary of the seven simming and bombings and the launch uh, yesterday of that memorial. Those are the challenges we face. They are as simple as allowing carers some time out to the challenges that we face working in a multi-ethnic society. That's what this is about. This is what we're trying to do. That's the challenges that we face as government. And one of the things that we believe very powerfully in the Office of the Third Sector and the government believes powerfully is that, that it ca government cannot, should not, and will not do that on its own. It has to do it in partnership with a whole range of agencies, jo not just the third sector, not just the public sector, but the private sector as well. All of us have to come together to face up to those challenges and make it happen. Another example, St Giles' Trust, an organisation working down in Camberwell, an incredible organisation who, who has the highest level of ex-offenders working in, its in, in the institution, taking ex-offenders into prisons to work with people as they're coming out. They have an incredible transfer rate of taking people out of prison and stopping them, stopping them re-offending in the first six months, which is, as we all know, if you re-offend in the first six months, you go on to another cycle of offending after that. They've got people working in the community. The community supports these people. These are ex-offenders, quite serious ex-offenders, working in that community, working around that thing. But the community supports them. It, it helps them because they understand, because they've created that partnership. Those are the kind of things that we're interested in doing. But um, in terms of unwrapping the secrets of a successful community, uh, I'm going to tell you some of them, but not all of them, because I think you should find out some of them for yourselves. But I'm going to tell you the ones that, in terms of what we do and what we believe the third sector can bring, and there's four main things, I think. Uh, the third sector and all of us have a role in bringing people together to have fun, to engage, to just be part of a community. It doesn't always have to have that meaningful purpose. It can just be about making things different. It's about creating and providing services. It's about new types of services. It's about delivering services in a different way. The personalization of care services that many of us will be involved in the next five, ten years as we change the nature of delivery of some of the care services, how is that going to be impacted on? How are third sector organizations going to work with the public sector to deliver that. 
challenging authority, not accepting the norm. The third sector and the state have to understand there's a huge range of organisations that are really angry with us as civil servants and really angry with government. And that's OK as long as we have it as a dialogue, as a partnership, as a constructive dialogue. And that's what we're trying to create, not just you said, she said, shouting at. Um, an example I always use is that one of the royal boroughs had this problem. It had been funding um, uh, uh, swans, I think it was. It was anyway, they had the royal swans in their area and they'd spent hundreds for 200 years been funding this small charity um, to kind of get uh, to look after the swans and after 200 years and a massive influx of refugees into Kensington or wherever it is, they thought they might reprioritize that money uh, to you know set up a refugee group or something like that and of course the first thing that happened first time they mentioned it front page of, of the Kensington Chelsea News government to cut slash budgets for royal swans no way of having a dialogue no way of transferring resources from one to the other no way of understanding that we need to change priorities so that's about creating a dialogue and then finally and a huge role that we've got at the moment for communities across this country is about how do we get them through the recession how do we create jobs how do we create new jobs how do we create money that stays and is, helps communities so a whole range of issues there those are the four things I'm just going to very briefly talk about some of the things that government are doing to help in those four areas and how we think that might help um, create stronger and better communities uh, in, terms of, um, uh, in terms of the first thing that we're doing, and I think if you're interested in this, we've just also um, undertaken, and I, I use this word advisor because no one said I can, we've just undertaken the world's biggest survey of third sector organisations. So unless anybody can tell me different, I'm going to continue using that claim. Uh, but we've just surveyed over 50,000 local frontline community voluntary organisations in England. It's a representative sample in every single local authority area. And we've asked them a series of questions about how the, the, the local state is helping them to thrive at what they do. And there are absolutely, as you'd expect with all surveys, really challenging but really positive things. There are places where communities are absolutely coming together and feel that there's a real partnership between the state and the third sector, which is really helping communities to, to, to do that. There are other places where there are far greater challenges. But for the first time ever, we have an evidence. It's all on the line. You can go to your local area. Any of you, as citizens, you can go and you can find how is my local area doing with my local third sector. If you many of you are volunteering or giving locally what are your organizations how are they working with the state in that area we've got that evidence we're working with local authorities across the country now to create a new dynamic at a local level that creates a new partnership that helps communities to grow um, the second thing that we're doing is that in terms of bringing people together, a huge investment, which is why I was asking you about volunteering, huge investment in encouraging all of us uh, to volunteer, to take part, to give that little bit extra, either in your workplace, in your community, at your home. We have a huge investment in youth volunteering. We hope to create a million new volunteering places for younger people. The government's just launched a sort of pilot, series of pilots about creating a national community service in schools, so getting young people to do up to 50 hours of community service in their schools so they get that very early age, they begin to understand that they, there's a real pleasure, there's a dynamism in, in working in communities. I was with a group of young uh, girls from South London uh, uh, last week and they were talking about their experience and we were talking about volunteering and they, the most extraordinary thing they told their friends about um, their boyfriends, about drugs, about sex, about music, the thing that they were all embarrassed, all of them connected, all of these young girls, was they all volunteered. They all did something in their community. They helped out in the local centre or, or they, they helped out with their mum's friends. None of them would tell each other about that thing, whereas they'd tell them, you know, that they'd got drunk and fell in over the night before. They weren't embarrassed about that. So there's a whole culture shift that we need to make about helping, about supporting, about putting something back into your community being important. So a whole series of investment into that volunteering infrastructure as well. A whole range of work, which many of you, I hope, are involved with, in encouraging us as government to be better shoppers. When we're buying stuff, we're buying services at a national level, at a local level, at a regional level, are we really thinking through that we've got the best people to deliver that service? Are they really in touch with their community? Are they working with their users? Are they representative? How do we understand that? How do we buy those outcomes that we want? We've got a huge program of training national com of commissioners. We've trained over a thousand local and national commissioners about how to work better with the third sector, how to understand more that dynamic of getting things that help communities. A whole range of that. The government has just set up its first cabinet subcommittee, uh, which in, in, kind of in cabinet office, that's very important trust me, uh, um, um, uh, that makes and supports a cross-government approach to coordinating how we deliver public services through the third sector and how we can do that better.
finally, and well, uh, we're also doing a lot of work on, uh, strangely, and this is one of the challenges of my job, and I get a lot of complaints from my colleagues in the civil service. One of our jobs is to encourage third sector organisations and communities to complain about government, to campaign against it. We are actually the only part of our government that is putting over a million pounds into organisations to help them campaign. Very challenging, very difficult thing to do. But if we genuinely believe that communities need to speak up, but they need their voices to be heard in a constructive, in a positive way, that many of the communities, many of the challenges we face about cohesion and integrating communities is because a lot of those communities don't feel that their voices are heard and, or that they shout but they don't get any response. Whole huge range of work that we have to do as government are using the compact about new forms of consultation to make sure that people have their voices heard and we respond to that in a positive and an engaging way. It's a critical thing for all of us, I think, as civil servants and, and others. It's very challenging, very difficult because people, we put a lot into our work and people just respond and we feel very negative about it and that's fair enough, but we need to create a new dialogue if we want to create new communities. And then finally, a whole range of work that we're doing with, particularly with DWP, about putting the third sector at the heart of creating new jobs and communities. We have a £10 million programme where uh, anyone who's unemployed for up to six months now has the opportunity to go volunteering, a really meaningful volunteering experience to create, create and challenge their skills. We have £150 million worth of the Jobs Fund for social enterprises to set up new businesses and communities to create lots of local communities. Lots of people have ideas in their communities. They know what the answer is to their problems. They know what local people need. They want to set up that business, but nobody's backing them, or they want to keep that business for themselves. There's been a quadrupling in the number of cooperatives that have been registered in this country in the last six months. People are wanting to do things in a different way. They want to come together. They want to think about creating their communities and doing things in a different way. Our job as a government is to support that, to facilitate it, to get out of the way when we need to. So, um, how are we doing that? Whole range of mix of finances, whole range of different approaches. Um, the challenges we face really are enormous and why it's really exciting to see so many of you today because this, uh, for me personally, this agenda, this, this community agenda, this cohesion agenda is the most imp one of the most important ones that we face as a country and in government coming over the next five, ten years. The economic challenges, all any of us who have lived through any of the previous recessions, my memories of as a child are growing up in Scotland in the 80s recession and the huge challenges that that brought to all of the communities that I lived around, the mining villages, the other steelworks that closed down, the challenges that that brought to those communities, not just economic challenges, but the cohesion challenges. That tension brings cohesion. We've seen that in the election results that we've seen recently in the local elections. There's a challenge to all of us in government. How do we challenge that? How do we face up to those challenges? How do we get on with that and face up to that? So it's about new partnerships. It's about my challenge to all of you is think about what you're doing in your job. Are you doing it the way that you could be doing it? Is there other ways of doing it? Are there new partnerships to do it? Uh, and are there new ways of approaching it? So I'm going to finish there. Thank you very much for your time, but I'm not going to ask you any more questions because you can ask me some questions at the end. Thanks for your time. <coughs> okay. Hello, everyone. Um, my name's uh, Steve Weiler. I'm from the Development Trust Association, which is an independent um, charity, third sector organisation, working with community organisations right across the UK. And um, well, Campbell said that you know he's keen to encourage third sector organisations like ours to um, complain about government. So here goes. <laughs> Don't worry. Don't worry. Um, actually, I've got a, a pretty positive story, to, we do campaign, but I've got a pretty positive story to tell about how we're working together between the community sector and government in, in recent months and hopefully in the future. And what I want to tell you about is um, an extraordinary revitalization of community-led action that's taking place right across the UK and how government is helping to make this possible, and where we've got to, and what the future might perhaps hold. And I want to, to ask you to, to think about, first of all, what is, what is your image of a community group? I, it seems to me that the brand is a bit of a damaged one. And when I talk to people about what they think a community group is, maybe some of you are thinking this, that you know, it conjures up this sort of vision of the the saddest kind of place. You know, dingy hall, you know, some miserable community cafe that nobody in their right mind would think of going to. Um, kind of full of despair, really. 
Or perhaps, you know, some sort of self-perpetuating little clique, a club run by uh, self-important bossy people. Yeah. Recognize that? Or maybe some, you know, some kind of fractious, incompetent pressure group blaming everyone and everything except, of course, except, of course um, themselves. And, of course, such organizations, such places do exist. We can't pretend otherwise. But I have to tell you, and this is a good news, they are dying out. And what's on the ascendancy is something in the community sector completely different. And I would love to take each and every one of you on a journey to show you at first hand places like, for example, the Goodwin Trust on a tough inner city estate in the middle of Hull. 12 million pound turnover, their skills training, neighborhood wardens, their health, youth work, all run to the most you know, impressive quality standards. Their fabulous eight million pound octagon center when they designed it, they, they, rather than um, commissioning architects, they employed architects, got them to live on the estate in an empty shop front for three months so they could really get to know the estate and people could talk to them. And you go there now, there are people on the estate saying, look at that part of the building. I designed that. A different, a different very aspirational sense of purpose. And the key thing is, all of it, this whole operation, is run, managed, by their board of local residents from that tough inner city estate. Well, the Sunlight Centre down in Gillingham in Kent, in the southeast, but it's not a, it's not a prosperous area at all. Now, if we lived in Gillingham, I'm sure that all of us would, would use, would go to the Sunlight Centre on a pretty regular basis. It's a great place, very welcoming. When you go there, it's hard, really hard to know whether somebody there is a user or an employee or a volunteer. And the reason is that more often than not, the same person does a bit of everything, does a bit of all of those. It's a bright, positive, <coughs> bubbling place. It's, it, has a, it runs a cafe, and it's really it's a kind of you know, a high-class operation. Um, they employ ex-offenders and people with learning disability to, to run it. Um, it's full all the time. It's famous for its fruit smoothies. Local people from the nearby states, they go um, fruit picking in the countryside round, round about. They keep half of the fruit they pick, and the other half goes to the cafe. It's simple, it's healthy, it's very people friendly. And it's no surprise that Sunlight Social Enterprise Arm has now won a major contract to deliver catering services for its local council. Um, and I think they're planning, plotting to take over catering services at Eland House for CLG as well. I think that's the next one on their list. And I, I wish I could take you to all the 470 community development trusts that I work with, and to the settlements, and to the community centres, and to the similar organisations all around the country that are reinventing themselves so successfully. And the three main ingredients that are driving this, a spirit of, of, of self-help, a spirit of enterprise, social enterprise, and of community asset ownership. And I don't have enough time to talk about all these things, but I'll say a few words about asset ownership. The idea of communities, community groups, owning and managing land and buildings themselves. Um, turning liabilities in their communities, eyesores, things that are a magnet for crime and economic problems. Turning those liabilities into something of value refurbishment and new builds, creating a foundation for the kind of work that we do see in the Hull, in Gillingham and all those other places. Already within the Development Trust Network alone, 490 million pounds of assets in community ownership, helping those organizations generate uh, over 100 million pounds of earned income every year. So how is government involved in this? Well, first of all, there was a few years ago a pretty sharp debate about whether or not community asset ownership was a good thing or not. And so government um, appointed its local government efficiency advisor, a man called Barry Quirk, who is the chief executive at Lewisham Council, 
Um, they appointed him to look into this. And his report was decisive and extremely influential. Basically, it said that local councils and other public bodies, national and local, should revisit their assets portfolio. And they should consider a mix of possible actions. They could either hold on to their assets to continue to deliver public services directly. They could sell them, try and get the best price possible, and use those receipts to fund new work by the state. Or they could transfer them, sometimes at less than best consideration, to high quality community organizations who would then be able to use those as a foundation to create further community impact. And Barry Quirk, this very tough-minded man, said that in some cases, the community asset transfer model could be the right one. It could be in the best public interest. And that, of course, as with any course of action, there were risks, but they could be perfectly well managed. They have been in the past. There are examples all around the country. And the secret was to develop a relationship where people really do work together effectively. And CLG and OTS, to their huge credit, were commendably fast to act on this report. They've worked closely with my organization, with others in the community sector, in the local government world. A whole stream of initiatives have, have flowed from that. The lottery were given 30 million pounds to incentivize asset transfer from local councils. There was enormous appetite for this. Five times oversubscribed in a very short space of time. We've set up an advancing assets program, currently working with 73 local authorities across the country and their community partners. We've launched an asset transfer unit, which was mentioned earlier, providing technical advice. We're running a program with Co-ops UK to pioneer new forms of community shares and bonds to help people individually buy into some of these schemes. We're helping community groups in the recession find uh, temporary meanwhile uses for empty, boarded up shops and, and premises on, on high streets and, and, and bring them into um, social use. We're setting up community land trusts. The 70 million pounds community builders program that was mentioned earlier is now getting underway. It's being delivered by a third sector consortium led by the Adventure Capital Fund, including ourselves, um, to make investments, and the word is investments, in community assets for multi-purpose community anchor organizations. If you want to find out more about these, there's a workshop later this afternoon, workshop strand four on, on community assets, and maybe some of you would be interested in that. But you know, this is still the early stages of a journey. It's still small scale. We are seeking something very big. We're seeking to transform from the bottom up the ways things are done in communities right across the country. As David and Campbell have, have made it quite clear, this is not about command and control. It's not about the kind of centrally imposed vertical interventions that, however well-intentioned, further atomize and divide. It's about tapping into the energy and the creativity that does exist within even the most written off deprived communities. It's about recognizing that the core solutions to community breakdown can only come from, from within those very communities. And it's about re recognizing that the big programs of regeneration spending have largely failed and that we need a new approach based on a culture of investment rather than spend. And looking ahead, we see this now, it's very clear to us, this is a cross-party agenda. We're talking across all the political parties. There's immense interest across the political spectrum. The recession brings terrible challenges. It will bear down, it is already, um, most heavily in our most deprived communities. But it also brings a once-in-a-generation opportunity. The threat of growing intolerance, disaffection, that recessions always bring, will best be met if we can accelerate our efforts to relocalize the economy, capitalize the poor, create far more community assets, community-based enterprises, self-help and self-determination. 
the community sector can't achieve that alone. We can go a long way. We can't achieve it all ourselves. Government also can't achieve that alone. But working together, I believe we can. Thank you. So, over to you. Questions, comments. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take them in threes, and I'm going to start out, Campbell, by, by asking you to answer, and then Steve, and then I'll finish off. So um, could you uh, say who you are uh, uh, and what organisation you're from? Um, I work in UKBA. My question is nothing to do with UKBA, but the general public. Um, you do say that uh, you want to encourage people to do voluntary work. You also want to encourage the immigrants to do voluntary work. What about the long-term sick? Right. Okay. And do we have a, a third question for this group? Oh, let's uh, go in the middle there. Uh, Graham Bay, Treasury Solicitors Department. We've heard a lot this morning about uh, empowerment of communities, which is great. But I get the impression that powers have been consistently removed from local authorities um, over the last decade. And is there not some sort of conflict here between the removal of powers from local authorities and the desire to empower communities. Okay. Thanks very much. Let's, um, let's start with you, Cameron. Okay. Um, I'll start with that one. I think that's a, a really interesting and challenging uh, question. I think one of the, uh, uh, one of the things that I've most recognised since I, I got my job in the Cabinet Office, um, I, I find myself quoting um, uh, it's either Tony Benn or Keith Joseph, uh, who said uh, that they'd spent 30 years of their life um, trying to get hold of the levers of power, only to find that when they did so, they weren't actually connected to anything uh, at all. Uh, and I think that's the challenge that we all face, is recognising that we, the, the need to devolve power to the most appropriate place uh, for those people to make decisions. Uh, and I think there is a big challenge going, uh, going on and a big challenge in government. Many of you might have been involved. I, I was in the development of the recent the local authority agreements where central government and local government for the first time really came together and really decided what some of the priorities were nationally and locally. And I think that brought his big beginning to bring about. I was, a, I was one of the central government's champions where I worked with Bristol and I spent quite a lot of time up in Bristol negotiating when central government was saying, we want you to do this in Bristol and Bristol was saying, well, we want to do that. And the central government was saying, well, it's our money and, and that. And so we had this kind of proper negotiation and dialogue between central and local government, which about what were the priorities, how could they work together. So I think there is an opportunity to do more of that. I think there's also an opportunity, and it's a big challenge for everyone, about devolving more power locally to, to trusting people to do that. I'm not certain it's about powers uh, per se. It might be, it might not be in some things, but I think it's also it's about um, recognising who has the decision-making process and who can do that. So there's, I think there is something there. I, I mean, I think there's a very big question, and I'm happy to, you know, other people I imagine who have quite have a lot of views on that, but um, I'm happy to come back on that one, but I think that's a, an important one. The opposite direction. Uh, wait. That's, that's um, being centralised rather than devolved. In other words, say, yeah. we're devolving and decentralising and empowering. The reality is exactly the opposite. I, I'm going to come in there because um, I think what you're saying is true if you look through a sort of 20, 25 year period. Actually, over the last 10 years, 
there has been a pattern of devolution of power to local government. Uh, and there are lots of sort of precise examples of that. Now, um, for example, in 2000, uh, local councils were given a power, uh, and it's in technical terms, called to promote well-being. And it means essentially that unless uh, they can't do something, they can do it. So it's a very wide-ranging power. But that actually illustrates, I think, the problem. And the problem is that despite having this power in place, not many councils have made use of it or not to the sort of extent that you might expect. Uh, and the same is true with the sort of range of things where, um, you know, uh, powers have been passed uh, from Whitehall to, to local councils uh, uh, much more in the past, you know, in the past years than was the case before. But I think overall there is still an issue, and actually that's something that um, the government is recognising and it's part of the... The, you know, the current work on, on democratic renewal. It's a sort of significant strand of it. How can we push more power, actually, away from Whitehall uh, and out to local communities? So I'm not sure I agree... Well, I, I don't agree that, um, that there's been a, a process of centralisation over the last 10 years. I think the opposite is, in fact, true. But there is a lot, lot further to go. Central government tells local authorities how they must organise when they, they give them three options. But they still tell them that they've only got those three options as to how they should organise themselves. They specify the percentage of decisions that should be taken by planning decisions, for instance, that should be taken by officers rather than by local elected representatives, i.e., councillors. And just two examples of things that central government is controlling, yeah. which should be locally controlled. I'd Yes, I mean, I'm sure there are plenty of examples that you could take of that kind, but I think nonetheless, the overall thrust is different. And I, I would bring out the local area agreements point, because I, I think sometimes we don't understand quite how important those things are, you know, because they're a bit technical. But what's, what's happened a couple of years ago was that, um, again, as part of the, the, the budgetary settlement, the... Um, the, uh, the, the last spending review, there was a very conscious decision that actually the main way of delivering public services would be via local areas. So these things called local area agreements were set up, um, and uh, the number of sort of uh, bits of bureau bureaucratic targets that were put on local authorities were hugely reduced. And um, uh, for each of the sort of 150 main areas around the country, this this sort of process which Campbell took part in took place, whereby local authorities, other local delivery agencies, got together and said, these are the really important things for our area, and then they reached an agreement with central government about it. And, um, you know, again, I think there's plenty, to, plenty more to do. You know, there are issues about how you turn what is a process into something that's really democratically accountable, and we haven't tackled that yet. But you know, as a way of delivering services, it is quite different to, to what has come before, and it has the seeds of you know, a huge amount of change, actually for all of us in, in, in it, uh, you know, as, uh, as public servants. So I'm kind of, you know, I, I think there's, there, there is um, evidence, as I was saying, that um, uh, uh, actually in central government, we have been recognizing that lots of things are best done at the local level, and there's a lot more to do. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just, sorry just to pick up very briefly on, on, yeah. on the question the lady asked about. Uh, we've got a series of programmes in the office of the third sector to help a range of people in support. We've just, for example, launched a, what we call an access to volunteering programme, which is a million pounds to provide bursaries and support to disabled people to allow them uh, to create better uh, op volunteering opportunities or to create uh, uh, venues where, uh, which are more accessible for, for disabled people to volunteer. We've also run an, a whole series of different programmes. So we're doing, we, we, we quite often, we do a lot of work on targeting to see what, what parts of the community, what uh, parts of, uh, are, of, uh, you know, are not being accessing volunteering and able to do that. So we're always trying to look for those and we work in partnership with a whole range of volunteer providing organisations across the country to understand and support people back, uh, you know, whether they're sick or disabled or out of work, to access volunteering in a way that suits them. So we're very well aware of that. We're also, for example, um, just launching a programme to support 
both in the public sector and in, uh, and in the third sector, uh, volunteer managers, because actually it's a very difficult job to manage volunteers. And uh, it's quite hard managing people that you pay to turn up to work. Uh, uh, managing people who, who don't you need to turn up to work or have real challenges or have chaotic lives is very difficult. So we've got a whole programme of work to support volunteer managers. And again, that would be about encouraging people who might be uh, disabled or have been sick for a while and, and finding a way, that, a volunteer opportunity that really suits them and gets them back in and but isn't too much. So there's quite a lot of work going on if you're interested. If you, uh, Office of the Sector website's got some details on that. So those, I thought I'd answer that. I don't think I should answer the question about politics, really. Steve, I'll, answer your question. I'll answer the question about, about politics. And I mean, the, the truth is that, that there's a battle for ideas going on, and there always will be. And it's a similar battle, as, as we see it, happening across all the main political parties. Um, and you can see these kind of fault lines, really and maybe within government as well, between people who fundamentally believe that, particularly in poor communities, but a general feeling about people generally, um, that things need to be done for them, is one view, um, where you, you kind of do get, end up, un unwittingly sometimes, in a kind of command and control mm -hmm. position. Um, you also get the people who believe that, you know, the market forces will produce social benefits, so you can pretty well leave it all alone. And then there's a big number of other people who believe actually in the kinds of things that we've been talking about. And actually, but those are the, you know, those are those, you know, those are the debates that are happening in all mm -hmm. the main political parties as we see it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we are getting um, support at the very highest level, um, you know, right across the political spectrum. And I think you'll be seeing that in some of the articles and policy position statements, hopefully the manifestos as they appear. Now, just on the other two things, the local authorities and community empowerment, and is there a tension here? There isn't a way, but I think that, I mean, what we were, we found very helpful a, f a couple of years ago was when David Miliband um, was in CLG, yeah. and he started talking about double devolution. It's a very clumsy, very clumsy phrase, but the idea that central government could drive down resources and decision making down and down, down to local government. And the local government themselves had a responsibility to drive it down further to neighborhoods, independent community groups, and broader civil society. And that is a very simple principle, but it's a very good one. And I think that that's something we should try and hold on to. Um, we, we will create a far more participative, democratic society if we can pull that off. And, and um, it would be great if, if in you know, a few years' time we run a session like this again and the room is only a third full because all the rest of you will be working in, at community level and doing things on the ground with a great deal of responsibility and authority and ability to change things. Wouldn't that be fantastic? And then the question about people on long-term sick and community uh, groups, uh, voluntary groups, well... There's something quite interesting going on at the moment within DWP. Um, a campaign that has been running for some time for something called the Community Allowance. The, the idea is one of these great things. It's so simple. The idea is that people on benefits um, should be able to do part-time paid sessional work in local community groups and social enterprises within limits within limits, but as a way to get things done locally in their communities and a way to help people take those journeys out of welfare dependency. Um, needs to be managed carefully, but the principle is a fantastic one. And um, DWP have agreed that it should be tried out. Um, and, they, and we're working with them to establish the first pilots um, around the country, hopefully in the, in the coming months. Um, and I think it will be very interesting to see what we learn from that. <clears throat> and where that really is a way of um, creating some very positive social change. So the, the benefit system doesn't keep people down, but becomes a way of acting as a kind of trampoline um, or springboard to help people move up as well.